Hey, you looking for a way to unschool, unlearn, and unplug? You're on the right frequency then. Holistic wellness, natural law, spiritual teachings, esoteric science, suppressed history, survivalism for the road ahead, and a return to what makes humans human. Unhinged, unrestrained, uncensored. If you're weak of mind or of heart, this is not for you. Because this is Detox. Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to Detox, where we're activating that living water and uncoiling the serpent one vertebrae at a time. I am Ryan Thomas. Welcome to the D program. Happy holidays and all that jazz. In this episode, my guests are Veda Austin and Ryan Rosales. Veda was here just a few weeks ago talking about her book, The Secret Intelligence of Water. And we tore the damn house down, if I may say. And Ryan is her husband, making his podcast debut. He's a self-taught, self-learned kundalini expert. Not a scholar, not an academic, just a dude doing the work. And between the two of them, they have quite a lovely story that I wanted to share because, frankly, we need more lovely stories in this world right now. And this story does snake through several related topics, water, kundalini, orgasm, and so much more. And it is quite a long chat. Does take a little while to get into it, about 15 or 20 minutes. But once we're in it, we're whitewater rafting, if you know what I mean. So enough prologue, let's flip this script dialogue and pump up the volume on this consciousness enhancing audio. Enjoy. Veda Austin, welcome back to what I call the D program. Thanks again for being here. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. For sure. And Ryan Rosales, welcome to the show for the first time. Thank you. No problem. And you were just telling me you've never been on a podcast before. And I told you that's my favorite type of guest. So hopefully we're going to have some fun here and you won't hate it too much. (laughs) I doubt it. So let me preface our chat then by saying that uh, we're here now because after Veda and I chatted last time a few weeks back, which was quite the conversation, uh, we got to talking afterward and she told me a lovely story about how you guys met. And I'd love to start there because... As they say in the film business, it's quite the meat cute. Whoever wants to spin that yarn, by all means, please start spinning. <laughs> well, we we met at the water conference in Germany in, was it 2019? Okay. October of 2019. So just over a couple years ago now. We had kind of seen each other from across the room kind of thing. Just said hi. Um, hadn't really got into any deep conversation. Um <laughs> And then I forget if it was, it was a four day conference and it was the second or third day. I think it was the third day. Something kind of wild happens. So I, I wake up and I'm getting ready for the conference and I'm taking a shower and this, the steam is steaming up on the mirror and I, I kind of peek around the corner. It's uh, an open shower and I glance at the mirror and it kind of catches my eye, but I go back to my shower and it's, I'm kind of thinking about it for a second or two. And I'm like, no, I definitely saw something on the mirror. So I, I go to look back and I stare at it and I'm taken aback because what I see are what to me clearly look like her initials drawn on the mirror and the steam is like kind of brought it to the forefront. So I take a picture of it and at this point I'm like, I don't know this woman very well. <laughs> is this, something I should show her <laughs> or, or is she going to think I'm crazy? <laughs> so I, I guess I had gathered enough information at that point to, to know that maybe she would like to see this <laughs> given her background with water. So I pull her aside and I said, I have something weird to show you. And she says, I like weird. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh I showed her the picture of her initials and the and the steam on the mirror and uh there wasn't much of a reaction. She uh I think we were both trying to figure out how to uh react in that moment. <laughs> but that was the start of our relationship there really. Yeah, and just to kind of make some more context into the initials is that I gave a talk 
at the water conference. And one of the images that I shared with everybody was when I said to the water, do you know who I am? When it froze, my initials were revealed in the ice and they're linked. So the V and the A are linked exactly how I write my initials. And when he took a photo and showed me my linked initials in this on the mirror in the steam, it was just like how it showed itself when I'd asked water if it knew who I was. So there was even more significance in that. And I remember he said to me, what do you think that means? And I was just like, you can't figure that out. <laughs> but, but it was... Um, it was a lovely way to for kind of to kind of meet because it was so it was so unexpected. He lives in California. I lived in New Zealand, and we met in Germany. And water literally brought us together. And then some really beautiful things happened when we were in Germany. And Ryan really showed me how serious he was, and that he knew in his heart that he chose me. He did a few things that really made me realize, wow, this guy is really serious. He's somebody that I can trust. Because when a man literally takes a leap of faith for someone he hardly knows, but just shows that he knows his himself and his intuition, that really says a lot. It certainly spoke volumes to me. And then I flew back to California before I went to back to New Zealand. And he spent just like, happened to be her route home. Yeah. <laughs> and then he he spent like a thousand dollars or something just to spend a night with me <laughs> in Germany. When after we we left the conference we spent a night um where was it? In Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. And then he followed me back to California and made all these changes to his ticket so that we could spend three days together. And then I flew home and then I think a month later I flew back. And our relationship just kept developing. But you know when it's kind of like you just know somebody and you just kind of know and there's no explanation for it because it was not like we've known each other all that long, but it felt like we'd always known each other. When somebody kind of feels like home, you feel home. And so Ryan did some of the most romantic and incredible stuff I mean, that anyone's ever done for me in my entire life. And when a man just keeps showing up for you, Something really happens within, with certainly what something happened within me where I started to feel safe. And I think there's two things that both men, men and women really want to feel, which is safe and free. Those two things together. And it's very rare to find both of them in someone. And I think that says a lot about someone who really knows who they are. That reminds me of two things. One, I have my own meet cute story with an ex-girlfriend. Obviously, it didn't work out, but it did have something to do with a water fountain. So I thought, oh, that's kind of an interesting parallel here. Not quite as interesting. And also, since you guys are out there in Los Angeles and, you know, sort of the throes of Hollywood, there's a great movie from the 90s called Before Sunrise. Have you seen this? I don't know. No. Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, I don't know if you're big movie guys or gals, but um, similar story. These two people meet in Paris. One of them's a Parisian woman. The other guy is from America, and he'd just broken up with his girlfriend, and they meet on a train, and he's got to catch a flight back to the U.S., and he decides, oh, fuck it. I'm just going to stay. I'm going to stay in Paris for like a little while longer with this woman. And then, of course, you know, it's like they fall in love over the course of 24 hours. It's a great sort of encapsulated story that there are some sequels to it, too, that were just as good. But yeah, so you started this long distance thing, and I've done long distance things too, but with people here in the United States. So it's, it's you know, it's just a few hours to really any spot by plane. How did you guys manage that across the world? That had to be really difficult at first, especially as 2020 set in and the reality of what we were dealing with <laughs> came to fruition, which was stressful for other reasons too. I'm just curious how you guys navigated the sea of a long distance relationship during that time frame. Well, I think... Maybe I'll start and she can elaborate. I think both of us kind of had some experience in that. She had dated uh, someone from the U.S. before, so she was kind of used to traveling here often to see him. And I've been deploying uh, as a federal contractor for almost seven years now. So I've been consistently out of the country anywhere from three to six months at a time for the last seven years. So it's... It's something we were kind of used to. And I, I kind of joke about, I mean, not that it's funny, but I joke about 2020 and I say that 
with the lockdowns, people got to live the life that I've been living for the past six years. <laughs> so, <laughs> because when you're on a military base overseas for months at a time with very limited resources and not much to do, and it's the lockdowns really weren't. I mean, for one, I was deployed most of it. So, but when I was home, it wasn't any different than kind of what deployment was. So I think our experience over the years has definitely set us up for success because otherwise I don't think we could, we would have made it. <laughs> yeah. And even, I mean, not, it hasn't been easy. We, we use FaceTime. We spoke on FaceTime or he would call me or we'd call each other every single day when we were apart. And I think that made everyday life feel like we were still in each other's lives because my experience prior to that was that when I went back to New Zealand, I went back to my life. And so our lives became separate. But Ryan and I always, he would always ring to see how I was. We would always check in to, even if it was just to say, hi, how's it going? How's your day? And I think that that kind of constant commitment to choose each other every day, even when we're not physically together, really made a difference as to how our relationship has weathered this time apart and these long distances apart. I think that the, what the, was it? The longest distance we had was like, um, seven months. yeah, seven months after we got married. And, um, yeah. literally that was just, this is, it was just heartbreaking because we thought his visa would be approved to come to New Zealand to be with me and the children. However, it was denied. And so we'd set everything up for him to be coming home with me. But we got married and then two days later I had to catch a flight back to New Zealand. And so it was, I felt literally like my heart was ripped out of my chest. I felt angry that I had to leave because of the whole pandemic stuff and just I have children. I couldn't just leave the children. I have to go home and all these kinds of things. But our plans were just thrown out of the window in a really violent way. And I just remember struggling so much the last seven months of being apart because we were together for two months. I came over in December and left in February and it was like when we spent that much time together, I think we initially did it to see how we would, how we would do living together because our it was relationship. the longest time we'd spent together at that point. Yeah. Because prior to that, I was only flying over for two weeks at a time, but he, I came over with the children. So as a, as a single parent, as a single mum, obviously a big part of my life is my children. And so I brought the children over to meet Ryan and we have a, 20 year age gap and so for me I mean I really really wanted to see how he would be around two children 24 <laughs> 7 how that might work for him because <laughs> that's like a lot but the most wonderful thing and I've likened it I'll give this analogy and it's one of the things I think that has made me fall in love with Ryan more and more and more and more and more every day is that when I saw how much he his love expanded out to my children, and that was like an immediate thing. He loved and loves my children as if they're his. And I never expected that because I'd not experienced that before. And so it's kind of like, it's like I'm, I'm an artist and my children are the art that I designed. But because Ryan loves us all so much, he became the frame. And that's exactly what it felt like for me, and that's what he is to us as a family unit and and for me he's this frame where I can be as expressive and all these different things but he's always strong he's got me and he surrounds me and I've not actually really truly experienced that before it's pretty incredible for me to have experienced that and how much the children love him too and so once we, when we left to go back to New Zealand after that experience and we did loads of fun stuff. And I mean, he's a big kid too. He'll just like get into all these crazy slappy hand fights with, with my son Rama and he'll just like, you know, he takes them out like on the, um, on the dirt, dirt, dirt bikes and they do some crazy stuff. Like, <laughs> and it's just really fun to see. So as a mum, being able to like see him have fun with the children. And have like the patience of a saint, which is like usually comes with, 
We do. <laughs> you really do. It's like I keep thinking, wow, we met seemingly so randomly and we made such big decisions so quickly to be together. And he keeps showing up, baby, the most amazing man I've ever met in my whole life. <laughs> I get pinch myself. My God, this man is real. He's so incredible. And it's like, of course, it's hard. It's not always like the perfect. But at the same time, we've learned to like go through that. And he's held me in my spaces where I've been allowed to fall apart. And he's been able to fall apart in front of me. And I think because we hold space for each other and we don't run away from those times that a lot of people might run away from, that's really held us together as a glue. It sounds like you guys have, <laughs> you forged quite a bond here, quite a connection, which is extremely rare these days, I think, for people to connect on the depths that you guys seem to have connected at. I know just from my own life, like I, when I find people like that, whether they are romantically involved with me or whether it's just as friends, you know, or even some family members, like I can't tell you how, how great it feels to be seen and felt on those levels. And I just want to commend you guys for that, for being able to go to those depths. You know, I, Veda, I'm not surprised that you can, because I've chatted with you once already and we got to some really nice depth with that chat. And Ryan, just as a man to man, Ryan to Ryan here, like I don't meet a lot of men who are able to do that either. Yeah. So I don't know. There's probably some reasons for that in terms of uh, the attack on masculinity and what it means over the last several years. You know, it's pretty obvious that there's a, and I know you work adjacent to the military, so I don't want to throw out some government criticism or some culture criticism here. But Oh, no, that's completely fine. I'm... I just, I feel like that there is some sort of, it's some sort of socio-political agenda-driven stuff here, and it takes men out of that space. It sort of depletes them of that emotional depth and what it really means to embody divine masculinity, which I think is kind of what we're getting to here. It's what it sounds like. You guys have both stepped into that divine space in yourselves, and then you're able to meet each other there. And you know, like I said, that's quite beautiful. I don't see or feel a lot of that these days. Yeah. yeah. become increasingly rare, and even, I mean... She talks highly of me and I have to, I guess, live up to that and <laughs> realize that within myself. But I mean, there's no one, I don't think there's anyone else on the planet that I've been able to be this open and vulnerable with. And it might even come as a surprise to people in my everyday life, like what goes on between us and the person that I am with her and the things that we're able to talk about and discuss and experiment with and it's just, honestly, some of the things are just outside the perception of most people. So I feel like I have different identities depending on who I'm talking with or who I'm spending time with. Yeah, I think that's also common, too. I think a lot of people feel like they have to put on a different persona to be able to fit in with people. And mm -hmm. I felt that way for a long time, too. And then after a while, I just said, I don't give a shit anymore about meeting people on that level. Like, either they're going to meet me where I'm at or they're not going to meet me at all. And you lose a lot of people when you step into that, but you also gain so much more too. You, you get yourself back first and foremost, right? And then you also meet these new people and forge these new bonds and these new connections like you two have. And I actually kind of want to go back to that. So Ryan, why did you even find yourself in Germany at a water conference to begin with? Like how, <laughs> how deep does your interest in that topic actually, I mean, I mean, if you went to Germany for a conference, it obviously goes pretty deep. Yeah, it's been a long journey. Uh, surprisingly enough, I find myself studying water less somehow these days it's almost like i get to watch her and support her and her water journey and all the stuff she's doing with um her work and all of that and it's it's lovely to watch um, and be a part of and i love supporting her through that but going back i guess i feel like the seed was actually planted when i was really young in a different context so my there's a book called The Hunt for Zero Point. I think it's by Nick Cook. But it was this really interesting book about anti-gravity that my dad had read when I was young. I mean, he would show me things or pictures uh, from the book or talk about stuff. And I don't know who else he was able to talk to, but obviously he was able to talk to me about some of that stuff. And I'm glad he did because it kind of sent me down the rabbit hole, I'd say, at an early age. But one of the people mentioned in the book was Victor Schauberger. And at the time, I only... All I really knew of him was uh, his work with energy devices and kind of the implosion, the explosion. Yeah, and it it kind of have a had a 
it seemed almost like a, a, a myth to me at the time or this great mystery or something. But I, I didn't tie him to water until much later. But he was always kind of a inspiration to me growing up. Um, just something that stuck in my head and I couldn't get out. This uh, kind of idea of free energy or um, over unity generators, that kind of stuff. So I feel like the seed was planted a long time ago. And then it was actually on my first deployment overseas to Afghanistan. It just, it was kind of a random conversation about weather I was having with one of the pilots, which I'm, I'm a pilot myself, but we were talking about weather and tornado or no, it wasn't tornado, like more hurricanes and stuff. And just the way that certain things work, low temperature, high temperature pressure, that kind of stuff. And it got me thinking about vortexes again and sent me back. All right. Like I want to look up some of the stuff I haven't seen in a while as far as Victor Schoberger stuff. And one of the first things I found was this lady interviewing a couple, I think, I don't even remember who they were, scientists at the time, and uh, something about water having memory, you know, and at that time, just completely mind blown. Like, what do you mean? Like, water stores information? <laughs> like, what do you mean? I thought it was just H2O. And it, it just went from there. I couldn't tell you all the different steps, but at some point in the next year or two, I found Gerald Pollock's work, The Fourth Phase of Water, and that's one of the most interesting books ever. And it was kind of just back and forth. Sometimes I would, I'd go into a bit of a lull where I wouldn't really be too interested. And then I'd always come back and find different books or reread books. And at some point I had kind of peaked with my fascination with water. And, uh, I was on Gerald's website looking, uh, through his stuff and found the water conference and just decided I wanted to go. So I bought a ticket and there I was. Quite literally a decision that changed the course of your life. I mean, if you really want to like, go back to it, like, because yeah. who you guys are, right? Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of interesting work that Schauberger did on water. And like you said, the anti-gravity tech. And, you know, you mentioned your day-to-day -day background in the military and what you do. And then this conversation, dude, I have so many questions about weather myself. Maybe we can get into uh, in our second hour because it's behind a paywall. Maybe we could speculate a little more because I have a lot of questions for you about what you do in the military. <laughs> so I'll just save those. But um, I think what drew me into wanting to have this chat beyond your meet cute story was Veda told me that you are very experienced just practically with Kundalini. And let's just get right into that because I think these two things, water and Kundalini, actually pair quite well together. It may even be in some way kind of the same thing or one affecting the other. Mm -hmm. And we can talk more about that too, obviously. But before we do, you know, Ryan, just tell us a little bit about your experience, your studies in this area first. Well, it's, I'll say first, it's, it's kind of weird to hear that <laughs> expert Kundalini. Um, I, I guess I'm starting to wake up to that. I would say it's probably accurate. It's just, I, I'm not used to hearing those terms. And most people I know have no idea about any of that. Wouldn't be able to even have a conversation about it. So I think what recently kind of woke me up to that fact was, uh, one of Veda's good friends who's, uh, knows a lot about all of that, at least from her perspective, she she also thought that I was experienced, that I was pretty far along to to hear that uh, I'm in, you know pretty far along, and this is just something I'm getting comfortable with myself. But it's been a few years. I don't know if you're familiar with Montauk Chia. I, I can't remember the name, the title of this book, Secrets of Love Making, or something along those lines. But I was turned on to the book from an ex girlfriend actually years ago. Read through the book and kind of felt overwhelmed by all of it. Like didn't, it, it just seemed like such a long journey that I figured it would take me a long time to get to a point where I was competent in those practices. So for at least a year, if not closer to two years, uh, the only thing I did was the, I think the three finger method to prevent ejaculation, but allow for orgasm still. And I just did that. And at some point it just kind of became a normal practice for me. It was just a habit. And I almost had no intention of going beyond that. But I mean, I, I figure what must have happened over that period of time was just the energy built up and built up. And at some point, what I found is I kind of go through quantum leaps, where it seems like I plateau for a long period of time. And all of a sudden, I'll jump up to the next level. And then I might feel like I've plateaued for a while. And then I'll jump up to the next level. So after a couple of years of just, just that simple method, it seemed like overnight 
I jumped up to the next level and I was able to do most of those practices without external, the external method. I was able to do it with my own muscles and work with that. Do you have any specific questions or? Oh, I got, I got a ton of specific questions. Yeah. <laughs> so, and maybe we should just back up a little bit and tell the audience how you would personally define that concept of Kundalini as you've experienced it, you know, just like take us through, not necessarily like the intellectual definition of it, but, you know, give me like a physical body definition of what it is that you're doing and that you're experiencing. Okay. Well, I mean, I guess it's start, I'm very visual. I love to picture exactly where things are going, how they're moving. Um, so going through the, starting with the book and talking about the microcosmic orbit, I've always done my best to try and visualize and connect to the energy within the body and know like exactly where it is and how it's moving and what channel it's going through. Because for me, if I can't, I mean, I, I guess I never know for sure exactly how it's supposed to look. It's, it's more of a feeling. So I'm always kind of doing the dance between trying to visualize exactly what's happening and feeling what's happening. Because sometimes you can get too stuck in like the logical framework of it and miss the feeling of it. Does it feel hot? Like I have questions too. It's like, does <laughs> oh, yeah, it when, yeah. when you when that feeling is rising through your body? Do mm -hmm. you feel it as heat? Do you? How does it feel as a sensation to you? Is it just a pleasant sensation? Can you feel it like building, like a balloon, like blowing up, or like is it something different? I think I think that's can be the difficult part for me sometimes. Is there isn't always a feeling associated with it. So I think which is why I find myself visualizing a lot because it's almost like just trusting. It's almost having faith that this is real and that, that those channels exist and, you know, the chakras exist and that this is the way it moves. So for me, the visualization is helpful because I don't always feel anything. And some of it before I got to really feeling things was more visual. Like um, when I picture the energy coming up the spine and into the head, it's almost like there's a there's a, a hole in the middle of my vision and there would be different colors of light and it, it looks like a liquid. Like it's either like it's draining into the hole. So it starts at the periphery of my vision and kind of drains into the hole till it's gone. And sometimes it'll be the opposite. It'll start at the point and expand to the periphery of my vision. So I think I think it started at first very visual and less of a physical feeling. Is that how orgasm starts? Like, I mean, is that how that builds up as kind of like if you do not feel the buildup of the orgasm? Because when you orgasm without ejaculating, how is that different from ejaculation? Like, can is it, how does it feel different? Well, that's kind of the hard part that I feel like I'm still working on is that to stop the ejaculation and to move that energy upwards. I, there's, I mean, you could, there's so many different analogies you could, you could make, but you're so used, or men are so used to shooting it out physically and energetically. And it's, it's all very centered in the, in the genital area. So as far as retaining it, if anything, I would say half the time, it almost, it feels like I'm preventing myself from experiencing the fullness of the pleasure because I'm used to just letting go so i it's it's different definitely a work in progress to where it feels like you're digging a new trench like you're 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 digging a new line for that energy that water to flow and you're digging uphill i, I would say almost quite literally <laughs> to get to you know up the spine and allow the energy to flow because most people don't know it exists and to get to a point where it's open and flowing can be a lot of work and takes time. Is it pleasurable though? This is interesting for me because I actually have thought this question because he practices this a lot. And I get, and so there is like a, there is an experience that he's having. I'm just curious to know if it's what sensations are going through your body, if they're pleasurable or uncomfortable or because something happens. So it's like, how could you explain what that feeling mm. is? I mean, there's a lot of talk about the full body orgasm. And I think occasionally I can, I can feel a little bit of that, especially if I relax, like after, after I've retained the seed and allow myself to relax. There can be, especially with a partner, there can be that exchange of loving energy and of just all, <laughs> all the other energies, whatever all, all of those things are flowing 
uh, throughout the body in between two people. So are you doing yoga? Are you posing? Are you meditating? You know, what environment are you putting yourself in to even get to that state to begin with? I mean, that's something that we've really been developing together just since he's been here the last three months now that I don't think either of us have really experienced before. Yeah. Where outside of intercourse, I think some of our more powerful moments actually have come from just lying together and being in a comfortable, safe space where we're not thinking about all the externalities of the world, which is hard to do these days. <laughs> and opening our hearts and just melding, like mm. uh, melting um, into each other. I feel like we've gotten almost to a point of, of orgasm, just laying with each other at times. And that's definitely, we've come to know that that's the most important part. The physical stuff, anyone can do that. And there are important physical practices when it comes to a lot of this. But the most important part is whether you're doing it alone or with someone else is opening yourself up, really allowing the energy to flow, allowing your heart to be open. So when we really want to go into these practices and, and that space, we typically just lie together for a while and either talk to each other or sometimes we don't talk. We just feel into each other. It's very interesting how much we can feel and how much we're, we can intuit what the other person is feeling and what they're doing. Cause uh, in some cases I can think of something I can think I'm going to open my heart and I'm going to send this loving energy like through my right hand, through her back. And it's, it's so cool and interesting to see like an immediate response sometimes. And we don't have to talk about it. Like I just, I just do it. She receives it. She does something. I receive it. And we don't always know exactly what the other person is thinking or doing or trying to do, but we've kind of danced that dance enough now that we can feel those things. And it's, it's pretty amazing. I could add something to that in that a long time ago, a certain situation happened where basically I was taken to hospital. Everyone thought I was having a stroke. The doctors did all kinds of tests on me and they said, well, we think you're having some weird migraine. Off you go. I take these anti-inflammatories. But the next day I was stuttering. I had all these strange situation, things, physical things going on. I went back to the hospital and they did various tests on me. And they did a chest x-ray five times. And I'm like, why are you doing the same test? What's going on here? And because they had had x-rays from after I'd been in a car accident, I've been in a hospital for so, so much, they were comparing one chest x-ray with another. And they discovered that my heart wasn't just enlarged from stress. I didn't have myocarditis or, carditis or anything. It was as if someone had taken a man's heart and put it into my body so far as size-wise. They couldn't understand what had happened. And my, my heart seemed to have enlarged to such degree that it was as if I had a different person's heart. And so they wanted to do more tests. In the end, I actually discharged myself and I never had any of the symptoms happen that led me to hospital in the first place there. But I started to write about things I had no prior knowledge of, but I also started to see energy around all living things from that day on. And so it's as if I can see everything in a regular way, but if I choose to, I can see what color is around him or myself or any anything that's alive. And so when we are practicing this intimate practice, I'm able to look at and see what colors are moving through him and through us. And so when I see him, and a lot of big part of what we're doing together is the breathing. So there's a, a great deal of like, I'm imitating him and he's imitating me. Our breathing is in a kind of unison. And so when that happens, we're very much in sync. So I see these colors start rising through him and I can actually see it's like a, an energetic water flow that starts to flow. And we have been reading the book. What's the Magdalene? What's the book called? It's about Mary Magdalene essentially. And it's, it talks about these two serpents that climb up the spine and at the top they meet and there's like a, a chalice at the top and the two snakes are basically on either side of the chalice. And then they talk about the liquid that goes from, it's almost like they're being milked. And so that liquid is also called the amrit, the amrit, which is the Hindi with a Sanskrit way of saying the sacred nectar that drips into the mouth from 
And, and so we're practicing this, but I'm also watching it energetically. So it, I can see these different colors moving up through him. And when he's doing that practice, I can also see even to the degree that he could be going, doing that practice without me and I could be in the room and I could have my back turned to him and I can still see the colors going up through his head. So even though he might not be able to not necessarily easily explain the, the sensation, I'm seeing the colors and I see this kind of explosion that go off in his head when, when there is that kind of a certain type of climax. So it's like a, an explosion of color goes off inside his head when I see, when I'm watching him do that. But like he was saying, the best way that, I mean, certainly neither of us have experienced this kind of sensations or emotions, but it's the emotional aspect that I think we're both really interested in because it like, we have to be so vulnerable to be able to be so intimate. And when you're in a vulnerable space, it's so easy for for us to have an incredible connection. And then we've been finding that we will have like a week of hell and it will just be like all the stuff comes up, especially for me. Like I have all the safety stuff as a woman because I've had a lot of really horrible experiences in my life where I haven't felt safe. And so I'm constantly, we have like this incredible connection and we have some like real energetic exchange that feels like somehow it's like the energy comes together and we merge in in a way in which he also intuited that we I was given a Vogel crystal. It's made of citrine. It's pretty amazing and it's um a, it's hand cut Vogel it's a literal a, a real Vogel cut crystal. And he he was intuiting and he kind of put it on my chest. And I felt literally like the energy was being used and put directly through that crystal. And it felt like an icy dagger in my heart, which was like, I was like, what are you doing? I said, what are you doing? That was, that was interesting. That was one of those moments where I think we were just lying together. Yeah. And we were having a really profound just heart space and connection. feeling the connection between us. And I was just so deep into it. And it popped in my head like, reach over to the nightstand and grab it because I never really used it. So I grabbed it and kind of like what I said to you before about specifically moving that energy through the arm. So I was like, all right, I'm going to take this, all this hard energy. I'm going to run it through my right hand, through the crystal. And I put it on her chest and she had a very strong reaction. Like she almost, it was almost a fight or flight. Like she was like, what are you doing? Like she said, that's really cold. (laughs) <laughs> and I was thinking, well, okay, yeah, that makes sense. It's cold. <laughs> like it's a, it's a cold crystal. But then I realized, oh no, she means like it's more than just physically cold. Like I could see her like almost trying to get up and get away for a second. And then when she, I think she kind of realized to her reaction. So she kind of laid back down and just decided to stay in it. But it was such a powerful oh. moment. I think you started crying mm-hmm. after that and. Yeah, it was powerful for me because what he did, when you're in those intimate spaces, you become an automatic natural healer. So without him realizing what he was doing just by doing it, it did something that I'll share with you, which is kind of vulnerable, but it's real. It's true. So my mom died in 1999 of breast cancer, and she was like a literally a walking angel. My mom was my best friend, most beautiful woman in the whole wide world. And I saw everything she went through. And prior to her passing, she'd had cancer for eight years. I'd gone through some really awful stuff and she'd been really worried about me. I was in a very not healthy relationship with someone who was quite violent. And like I was scared a lot of the time. And so mum was like so worried about me. And this man did a lot of things which were really bad on multiple fronts, not just to me. And so my mum was just always panicking, always worrying about me and am I going to be okay and am I going to – all this stuff. And um, as a mother now, I completely understand. And so I remember um, going with her to to the store because my mum had had to have two mastectomies and I'd never seen her naked after that. And so when we went to the store, she had to buy a special type of bra. And I remember 
like opening the curtain a bit too early and I saw all of what she'd gone through. And I remember just being so upset because I felt so guilty. I believed, I felt that it was my fault she'd got cancer because I'd put her through all of this trauma and she'd been so worried. And even though when I eventually, because I, can, I can't hide anything, I just, it just comes out. I'm no actress, terrible, absolute bollocks. And so she obviously knew something was wrong and I just told her what I just told you and she said, it's not your fault. No, you're not responsible for any of this, any of this. And so I, I kind of managed after that. But then eventually after she'd passed, I, you know, I, I never really thought about it until a few, about last year sometime, and I was watching something on Netflix about healing. And I saw this thing about this woman and she does all the yoga and she's vegan and she's this and she does everything right, but she's got breast cancer. And such a big part of being unwell is around really accepting some of the things that have happened to you in your childhood, growing up, being able to like work through that stuff. Otherwise it manifests in the physical. And so I had realized after watching that, I had this epiphany that I had actually taken on board that I wished I could have had her cancer instead of her. Not that I want that, but I felt so bad about it that I'd taken on that energy and I realized I was going to make myself sick. I was going to manifest everything that I was thinking and carrying around. And in that moment, I was, I heard my mother in my way. I heard her, her just saying, just, release that you just be happy you don't take that on board and so I'd forgotten about all of that stuff and all of that that kind of little bits of healing I'd done for myself over the course of time when Ryan grabbed grabbed that crystal in his most loving heart space which is so powerful and put that crystal on my chest that's why I started crying because I started realizing he is healing that last little bit of that residue that was held inside of me and so within the vulnerabilities of being together we become healers for each other without even knowing exactly what it is that we're healing or what we're doing or what we're doing (laughs) but we just intuitively do it i think that at those lows though where we kind of have a really amazing intimate space we've talked about it he's explained it so well because He's so patient with me because I feel like I'm always the one that's like just falling apart all over the shop all the time because I've learned that this kind of relationship, this kind of commitment to a a real heart-centered, loving relationship requires a spiritual foundation because in the material, if I'm on the going along on the material track, with Ryan, which I've gone into multiple times, he'll tell you, it's a horrible place to be because in that space, all my vulnerabilities come up. So being 20 years older than him, I'm like, am I beautiful enough? Am I young enough? You know, am I X, Y, Z enough? You know, this, all of the, all the stuff, it just comes up. Are my kids going to drive him crazy? Is it too hard? What more can I do for him? Am I doing enough? Is all of this vulnerability going to scare him away because it's just so much? And then, you know, it's like, but in his strength of just holding space for me whilst I am falling apart and I'm sharing that I'm falling apart, which is also super hard to do that in front of the person you love, especially when you're sharing about like pretty enough, all this stuff. In those spaces, he's held space for me, but I've come to realize we don't work in that space. That space for him and I, it doesn't really work. When I'm in my spiritual strength, when I'm not in fight and flight, that's when the magic really happens between us. That's where he's, we have a God goddess relationship whereby I'm actually, I'm not in fear of any of those things. I'm actually an embodiment of a, a much greater part of myself. And that's why I think we, ch- we found each other because both of us have always wanted that because there's only so much superficial you can have until it gets really dull and boring and there's no, there's no reward in that. There's no satis- real deep satisfaction in that. Your soul isn't getting nourished by that. It's a temporary sense pleasure. But we are not just made for that. 
I love working with analogies, so I'm trying to come up with one here. But I know with myself, with this sexual energetic work over the years, most of it has been, or at least half of it. I mean, we've been together a couple of years now. So I'd say half of it was by myself kind of figuring it out. And my, I think my goal was kind of pleasure in a way, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it was always like, I think a lot of people are drawn to these kind of things because they want to know like, Oh, what can I experience? You know, am I going to go into this, another dimension or like, you know, <laughs> am I going to have this crazy experience and what kind of pleasure can I feel in the body? And it's like, of course those things are great. And I think it's the, one of the reasons that keeps us going. But what I found, especially with the two of us is that when you open up into these deeper levels, it shines, it shines a brighter light. And when that light gets brighter, it illuminates new things. And it's like, Hey, what's that box over there? <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know. Let, let's go see what's in the box. And you open the box and it's full of nasty things. And it's like, Oh, well, this needs to be burned. And we should probably throw this one in the recycling <laughs> <laughs> and we should probably wash it when we're done. And so it's, it's like we have these amazing moments of clarity and of truth and love and beauty, but it shines a brighter light and we find these boxes kind of hidden in the corners. And that's what feels like to us sometimes where we take a step back. But for me and for both of us now, I think we've both realized it's a step forward always. And when you've illuminated these things that need to be worked on or cleaned up or eradicated, that's that's the part I think that would probably drive most people away, which is damn which is damn near drove us away mm -hmm. from it at times. And sometimes it's hard to come back to. It's like as as amazing as these experiences are, it also opens up an incredible level of vulnerability and fear and anger. And it's hard to get through that sometimes. But if you are able to work through it, it's definitely worth it. So you guys have said so many things, but I think what I want to say to encapsulate kind of the last 10 or 15 minutes of the chat here is two things. One, this conversation reinforces to me what I've always thought about partnership and that the best partner is the one who comes along, Veda, kind of like water does, and it reflects you back to you and it shows you where you need to heal, how you need to heal what you have to work on. And it sounds like that's what you guys are doing for each other. You're the mirror and the reflection. And it's not like a malicious thing, right? It's not a confrontational thing. It's just, that's what love is, right? You have to make people aware of what they don't see about themselves because otherwise, how are they going to know? And I think beyond that too, what it sounds like to me is that you guys have, and this term has popped up a lot in the last like 10 years in the holistic health space, even in the mental health space, what you guys have done here is you've built a conscious relationship, your conscious coupling, I think they call it too. It's not about the superficialities of our material existence here. A lot of people I think do settle for that. They want the partner who provides the safety for them in different ways. And I think what you're talking about, Veda, right? Like you want to feel safe, not materialistically, not financially. I mean, I'm sure there's part of you that, that does want that as a human, but beyond that, you want that safety of when you lie next to each other in bed, you want that heart space. You want to feel that oscillation between each other. And that goes back to, I think, you know, what you were talking about, Ryan, with Schauberger's work, just like thinking about energetic devices in general, thinking of our hearts as probably the most important energetic device in the world, right? Because like I just said, they oscillate. They don't pump blood. They actually oscillate and vortex blood and water through there. Some of the stuff I've read over the years, like with heart math, there is an electromagnetic component to our hearts. And so in a very real way, at least as far as, you know, today's science is concerned, we're constantly, any anyone, if we're in, within a few feet or even meters of each other, there's constant information transfer going on electromagnetically even. That's fair. And that's absolutely true as well. I want to get back to this. I don't know if it's a connection or like a relationship that I kind of alluded to earlier with Kundalini and water, because I thought for a while now that the idea 
of kundalini residing at the base of the spine is another way to think physiologically even just about spinal fluid that we also know is stored there and that this fluid is just dormant or in active water that's then activated through this process you know through yoga or meditation or just lying in bed next to each other and then it moves up the spine to create that sensation to create this sort of awakening process you know that's how it's referred to in these more spiritual spaces it's a kundalini awakening right so have you ever thought about kundalini in a less esoteric way almost right just thinking of it more veda you know like your work with water as just another type of water that's in the body that then gets activated from this energetic connection well that's what i see when i talk about the energy flow so it's kind of that thing where it is I, we are bodies of water i talk about that all of the time we're bodies of water and i think i spoke to you i think it was you that i talked about what the symbolism and tears are it's like nobody knows what an emotion looks like in a tangible way but tears are literal embodiments of the tangible touch that you can taste them they are emotion encapsulated in water that have come out of the windows to our soul <laughs> so they have a, and they are expressing something from our spirit whether it's in joy or whether it's in sorrow it's such a powerful thing that ex that is kind of there is this feeling of water rising. I often have that feeling. I had an experience once, which was very, very, uh, never forget it. I was super furious at somebody, and I very rarely ever get really, really angry. I think I was 14 years old, and somebody had stolen something from my mom, and he came to the door, and I was so angry, and I had no idea that this experience would happen. But I started to feel this burning sensation at the very base of my spine, at the very bottom around my tailbone, and it was like so hot. And then I felt it so quickly shoot up my spine. My whole body became so hot that I could feel, I felt it moving up through my spine. And I saw it in my mind's eye as just this red fire going up my spine, hitting me in this, in the head. And I remember it just, it was anger that actually brought that up so fast. And I'll never forget that. Whereas I'm finding when I'm observing us in this more loving space, energy moves a little slower for me. And I'm watching my energy kind of meandering. It's not kind of like this crazy, hard-paced kind of waterfall or anything. It is like this meandering stream as it meanders through and up through my spine but the water itself is something which is like it's like this we have this kind of well that we pull from and the energy is kind of like every time our consciousness or our our loving energy is is kind of like the gives the water the ability to to draw from that well and start pulling that water up through the spine and up through into into the head and it's interesting because I observe it like that. So rather than kind of looking and seeing it go through the chakras, I'm watching it as if it's a, a river or a, or a tributary. And I just see it meandering and taking curves and moving like a snake does really up through the spine. And so I think my dad has this theory that on the full moon, because he's this quite famous fisherman in New Zealand called Bill Hohipa, known for his giant eyebrows and massive moustache. And, um, <laughs> he and he um he has this put these calendars out called the Maori fishing calendar. It's basically when the fish come out based on the, the where the moon is located. I interviewed him once on something I was doing and I said, you know, what's your theory about the full moon and why people go kind of crazy on a full moon? And he said, Well the tides always become so full on a full moon. And he said, I think that that's what also what happens in the body is that the water somehow kind of expands and that also pushes stuff out of people. And because we're emotional beings and emotions are held in the water of the body, they're kind of pushed out more to the surface. They become more prevalent in those moments. It's probably another reason why babies are often born around the full moon because the amniotic fluid around the baby and, and the baby itself is the water is expanding. It's expanding around the mother. And so it, it makes the pressure even more great. And all of my babies were born on full moons. So mm. I think that there is um, something really in that where I think that we have the ability to use the water within our body in all these different types of ways when we become more sensitive, that we're fluid, mm. emotional oh. beings. And I think that that's the, the way I see water is literally fluid emotion. 
And so when you are intimate with somebody, the water within you is having an experience with the water in somebody else. And because water is in, and we're always in different stages, and I've often described the fact that I don't think human beings are only liquid water. I think our energy expands out of from the liquid into the air. And that's how we feel energy when we go into a room, kind of like a, a spider, like builds a spider web, sits in the middle, and something can just brush past the end of the spider web. It feels it, but doesn't know what it is, but it can feel it. And so I think the water's expression goes past just the physical body into another realm simply we just can't see because it's in the air. And so when we're just lying together, for example, the physical part, the liquid water within us is moving and rising and kind of whenever you make, put even a drop into a still pool, it's going to create ripples. When you're working with a stream inside of you, you're working with a whole other kind of situation because it has to, it keeps on moving. It creates this kind of ripple effect. And so then when you add in the water expanding and there's that kind of emotion expanding out from the body to the other person, there's another type of exchange, which is more even in the subtle body rather than the physical body. And so there then becomes another type of love making, another type of intimacy that can be felt, which was very hard to explain. I got a question about, you know, Silveda, what you were just talking about. And Ryan, shut me down if this is too much to ask your wife. But we're talking, you know, talking about <laughs> orgasm earlier and talking about the sort of sexual connection here. You know, when women have a physical response in their vaginal area, it's, it's just, you know, what is that? You know, like people describe it as, as wetness and, you know, being wet. What is that in the body? Like, what is that? I mean, you know, because men, I understand, you know, we, we ejaculate and, and I guess even prior to that, you can produce some of that wetness as well, right? But for women, like, I've never really understood what that is or where it comes from. Would you consider that also ejaculate? Would you consider it something else? I have no idea. But I think what you're talking about, it's some sort of energetic response to the moment that you're in. And I just would like to hear you guys talk about that, if you have any speculations about that. I mean, for me, it's so obvious with bodies of water. So we're going to have a watery response. <laughs> I mean, everything when it comes to procreation, even, even down to how incredibly sophisticated our bodies are, a woman's cervical mucus will become stretchy when she was, when she's fertile. So then it becomes a hospitable kind of environment for sperm to then reach the egg. It can't, you can't get pregnant if the woman's cervical mucus isn't in that particular type of fourth phase water. Mm. It won't work. Otherwise, yeah. it's it's not hospitable. Seems so, that water's involved in every aspect. In every of aspect. <laughs> so when a woman is aroused, you know there is secretions within within women, which uh, it's a it's a, a very natural kind of experience. Because if we didn't have that kind of response, our intimacy would be painful intimacy would actually not be a pleasurable experience and I think our bodies are designed in such a sophisticated way that intimacy is designed so that we can have pleasure so that we can also it's not just all about it's not just pleasure for men there's a lot of pleasure for women any woman that tells you that she doesn't enjoy having intimacy you know has probably not experienced really great intimacy and that, unfortunately, is a case for many women. I think There's... I think that is the key. Mm -hmm. If there was a key, <laughs> is intimacy. I see random things. I couldn't give you an exact number, but I see random things over the years of like percentages of women that haven't actually had an orgasm, or you know, this or that. Probably just comes down to intimacy. Like they're not actually connected to the person that they're having sex with. On one other note, what was the thing you posted earlier about? If the eyes are the window to the soul, then yeah, I just yeah, posted. Then tears must be an expression of the spirit. Yeah. So I don't know if that answers part of that, but <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, I think the point of that question I just asked was also I know women and have heard of women talk about this too, where they they have that body response, that arousal response, I guess, from mm. things that have nothing to do with sex. You know, like <laughs> a good conversation. 
that's what I was trying to comprehend here was, was what is it that's actually creating that charge in you, creating that response in you? It's got to be a connection of some sort. It's not the act of having sex it, because that happens before you have sex, right? If we're just talking about it in a sexual way. But I've heard some friends of mine describe like I've gotten that way out of the sexual environment. It just kind of happens. And I was just trying to get to that, you know, that's got to be an energetic response between you and the stimulus, which could be another person. It could be, you know, like I said, like this, this environment that you're creating with somebody, you know, like through conversation or through, through intimacy, just lying in bed next to each other, where you're not even being sexual. It's just, you're synced up on the same wavelength. Right. And I think that that's what produces that response. I think so. I mean, there are, there are times where, you know, we don't get to that super, super deep level of the connection and heart space that we prefer to be in for starting the physical sometimes it's a bit of a dance where it's like we've gotten a little bit of the way and now we're going to start into the physical and it's just a dance back back and forth between physical things and an intimate uh connection so there's that dance sometimes we go all the way with our connection first and it's like it's not until we get to a certain point that we'll even start the physical but it's it's not to say like if you don't feel the greatest heart space ever and you're if you're not the most deeply connected you've ever been then don't even bother with the physical like there's definitely a dance to be had i think Mm. um it is definitely a dance but um kind of coming around to the question you were also saying around that it's like foreplay doesn't have to involve a, a physical contact it can start with things like the other day the other day I like had um, to get on a, a podcast in the morning and I'd, I was like, I've been experiencing quite a bit of anxiety the last week or two based around some situations. And so that's been affecting me. Like I need to find ways to just relax and calm down because there's just been a lot going on. But Brian did this thing. He made me a coffee and he made me, some toast with some avocado and the stuff we both love called Promite on it. And I was up doing my makeup in the bathroom and he just brought it up to me and I wasn't expecting him to make me any food. So that little heart exchange, firstly, he had to think of me to do that in the first place. Firstly, he also knows I hardly ever eat on time or do anything much for myself in the way of any of those things. So he thought about that. I also had about eight minutes to get on the road to work. Yeah, and he was literally <laughs> just about to go to work, but he took the time to do that for me, which for me, as far as like starting to feel like in those ways, that made me feel like that because I felt cherished, I felt nourished. And when you start feeling nourished, your body starts to respond in that kind of way when we are literally bodies of water. And women, we're so in touch with that because you know we have we can have children and we have to be very intimately connected into our womb and into the fluids of our body and so there is this part of me which is like very aroused by small gestures and I mean Ryan also always means what he says so on the odd occasion if he just even says something really kind like you look beautiful or something like that that will give my whole body a response because it makes my body kind of feel nourished or even if he's like doing the dishes my god this man like looks i mean i've had some really wonderful experiences sitting down like just watching him with the tea towel over his shoulder like in the kitchen doing the dishes or cooking i mean it sounds so boring But my God, when you've been a single mum raising three children on your own and you always have to do everything for everybody else, somebody just doing the dishes and somebody making you some food, somebody asking how your day is and somebody actually like cooking you a meal is like next level. (laughs) Oh my God, what can I do for you? And that's what happens when he does stuff like that for me. I want to return it tenfold to him like what can I do for you and I think we both like to give to each other and I think that that's one of the reasons we work as well because we don't ever feel like we're being depleted 
That's a great answer. That's what I was trying to get to. Like, there are those moments throughout your day that do create that energetic response inside of you. You have nothing to do with any kind of sex or sexual activity. And I think that that's what's beautiful. You know, that's what I was getting to earlier about the connection that you guys have built, this conscious coupling sort of idea. Those moments create that response because you've already met each other in that space. So it's almost like everything that you do is capable of creating that response in your bodies. Right. And it's involuntary. It's not something that you even think about. Right. It just happens. We talked earlier, you know, you mentioned kind of this serpent idea you know, with water and Kundalini, you know, and Kundalini is known as the serpent goddess. And that's always whenever I've heard that, I've always thought of like, you know, it seems more like a river snaking its way through nature or in, in this sense, maybe through your body. And I've also seen Kundalini referred to as the living water. And that's more in a, like a Christian faith-based sense. And I wanted to share something with you guys because you mentioned that you were reading a book about Mary Magdalene. And I believe Jesus actually refers to this living water or Kundalini in a passage in the book of John. And I just want to share it with you. I thought it was kind of interesting and a, a different way to look at these teachings and how they do permeate throughout every culture. And so the context of the story is that he's waiting at a well of all places. And his disciples have went off to the city to buy some food. And this woman comes along to draw some water from the well. And Jesus tells her, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. And I saw that passage, my preparation here, I was just reading some different sources about Kundalini and how it does map over to different belief systems. And that stuck out at me because springing up feels a lot like the idea of the coiled energy, right? The coiled serpent that springs to life. And we do know that just for example, that Jesus spent some time in India and we don't know really what he did there because it's not written down, but I assume he may have learned some things like this. And I, it makes me wonder too, if the idea, the Christian idea of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost isn't just their way of describing kundalini because they say the power of that spirit or ghost is located in the sacrum bone or what we would call maybe the the sacral chakra and obviously those words are are variations of the word sacred so i don't know if you guys have heard this or you have any comments on that i just thought you know I, go ahead oh no i was saying i, I probably read the passage before <laughs> I, I grew up as a christian but my I, i'd say my view now is probably that most religions are touching on very similar things and that they've just gotten either just lost in translation over time or maybe even purposely manipulated. But yeah, I mean, I, I would have to agree with you that a lot of what even the Bible may talk about can have a much different meaning than what it's typically seen to have. Um, also, I'll say that with the book that we're reading, Mary Magdalene, she's talking about how women have like a magnetic energy and men tend to have an electric energy. And so there is a part which I find really lovely where she's talking about what the term nesting. So it doesn't have to be after having intimacy, although she refers to that as being an optimum time where the masculine energy literally nest, nests within the woman's energy and, and stays there for a long time. And that magnetic energy helps to build his uh, sort of what's termed in the book is car body, but it's kind of like a another energetic body. So there is this idea, and I've spoken to Ryan quite a bit about this and some other people I know that have some of this practice, where there is sometimes this concept that one of the reasons to hold your seed is to extend your life. There's a certain reason for it. And some some people, especially in history, have thought of women as taking that life force away from them. And so this book is actually saying that, no, when you're in an intimate, connected space, the woman can, in fact, enhance that energetic. And so you don't, you can choose to hold your seed or you don't have to hold your seed. Either way, there are ways of bringing this magnetic energy together and helping it to actually give you more energy, to help to build that kind of energetic body that is in a more spiritual realm and that's a nice way that we can work together and I, I it's interesting the idea of these kind of serpents because so often a serpent has a, a different connotation sometimes as being in the garden of eden or you know, it has this kind of idea and yet we talk about these serpents going around through our bodies 
but I, when I see it, I'm not necessarily, I'm not really visualizing the snake. I think it's an, more of an analogy. I'm literally seeing light moving. And so when I've uh, recently posted about what I observe in water, when ice starts to begins to form, it's sort of like the water sends out these little shoots of ice that I photograph. There is this light that expands around the tip of the ice. This kind of little ice spike that starts to happen as it begins in the very early stages of it freezing. And that light seems to be the way ice builds. So it's as if water actually has its own light source that it can build from. And so when you're adding light into a body and you've already got water and you've got magnetics and you've got an electrical component, you have now got all of the, and we're also, um, salt water, not fresh water, which is part of that electrical component. It's also a crystal, it's a liquid crystal. Then you've got everything together for a life source. So if the life source really is water within the body, then it makes sense that it would form and flow as if it was a living water. It would form and flow as if it was actually alive. And if there is a living force within us, then we can connect to that. It's not We're not disconnected from it. We just aren't aware of it. And so it kind of climbs up. And being aware of it, then I think that's where real a real creation space happens. I love that because, like, where is it going? Why is it moving up into the brain? Why isn't it just kind of building and building and building in the sacrum? Why does it move up the spine? Why does that happen? And I can't think it's because whenever we have an emotional response, emotions move things. They move us along in life. They push us past our own boundaries. So there is this movement that happens with the emotional waters within us that actually push it upwards. And the only way is up, really, towards the higher realms of the chakras, the higher realms of the higher centers in our body. I think an important part of that, which uh, is talked about in different texts and probably different ways, but is that kind of transmutation of like transforming like lead into gold. And I think that process, like as we talked about, like like cosmic orbit and moving things up, I think it's moving the base elements, which isn't bad it's not to say like lead is a bad thing it's just one form of energy and you're you're making it into something different and more pure so that act of moving things up and even back down again once it's been we'll say we'll we'll just keep with the analogy of gold so turning lead into gold and then the gold flows back down and every time you're it's coming around it's continually purifying and transforming it into higher substance i think that can at least be one part of the explanation yeah i've done a lot of extensive reading and had many conversations on the podcast about alchemy and applying that sort of lead to gold analogy to your spiritual self your your spiritual transformation or transmutation as you said and it's funny how that maps over because when you dig into the alchemical process even on a material level it's a seven-step process and it always ends with the gold, which if you map that over to the spiritual aspect of that, gold is enlightenment, light, and similar seven-step process through the chakras from the base, the root, all the way up to the crown. And um, you know, going back to what we were talking about with Jesus and Kundalini and how these different systems map over, and they just talk about them in different ways with different words. Well, the alchemists, I think we're talking about probably the same thing here, you know, like moving from a base state to an enlightened state through a seven step process. And it's really just activating each chakra as it goes up the body. So yeah, I think we've solved the mysteries of the world here in yes. about 90 minutes. I want to ask you guys just a final wrap up question here. And it's uh, it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a stupid question. <laughs> One of my favorite quotes is Bruce Lee's quote, be like water. And Ryan, I'm curious, just from your perspective first here, you know, what does that mean to you when you hear that? Be like water. I mean, I've always been a go with the flow guy. (laughs) (laughs) As uh, anyone might tell you. So just roll with the punches. I think it's really simple. It can be so simple. Like go around the rock when you need to and open up a new channel when you need to. And whether it's good or bad, it's like life's going to throw things at you and sometimes the water's going to plow through it. Sometimes it's going to go around or under or over it, but go with the flow. Veda, do you have anything else to say to that? 
I love that quote too because he also goes on to say water becomes whatever vessel it goes into. And so I consider that this human body is a vessel, a container of water. So he says be like water. In that respect, we also are water with simply having taken the form of a human. And when I think of the idea of water and flow, water can be just the simplest little trickle, but it it can make such a huge difference as it keeps weathering stone. You know, it's like this constant kind of movement can make stone change the form of stone. And I think that water is always going to source. And that is a really important thing to remember, is that water in its natural state, in its natural way, is always finding its way back to the sea. It's always going its way back to source, just like us. We're bodies of water on our way to source. Wherever we're being taken is being taken towards source, wherever that might look like. And I think that that is something that holds true for me when I think about being like water. Also, being transparent like water being non-judgmental, being able to, because water will, well, anyone can drink water, anything can drink water. It won't say, no, I don't like the look of you. It will allow water, the water will go wherever it will. It's not in judgment. And I think these things that water represents are really a spiritual expression of a higher consciousness. Yeah, I think as I typed that note out, I had the same thought that you kind of touched on there was like, Actually, the quote's kind of misleading if you think about it. We don't need to be like water. We are water already. Yeah. Very interesting that you kind of said the same thing there. And before we do wrap up here, I want to give you guys a little sneak peek into what I, I guess, how I prepare for this. But so Veda, for our first chat, I had seven pages of notes and I got through like a page and a half of them (laughs) because we went in so many different directions. So I took out that page and a half for our chat here and I added some notes on Kundalini and... I guess, Orgon too, got back to seven pages of notes. I think we've made it through like maybe two pages of notes here. (laughs) So we might have to have a part three so I can actually get through the rest of this shit here. But I do appreciate you guys. I mean, we went, you know, we said two hours, it's been almost three. So I really do appreciate uh, you guys making the time for me here. And before we do go, Veda, I know people can keep up with you on your website and your social media, VedaAustin.com, uh, VedaAustin underscore water on Instagram, on Facebook. I'll link all that in the show notes, obviously. Ryan, is there any place, do you have any social media that you want to plug? Do you actually want people to start following you anywhere? Or? <laughs> they can if they want. Uh, I, I'm not doing any specific work, so it'd just kind of be my social life. But Ryro's World, so R-Y-R-O-S World is my Instagram. Got it. I'll put that in the show notes too for people who want to maybe stalk you on the internet or whatever. (laughs) But he's married, happily married guys, gals. So whatever. But um, seriously, no, thank you so much. I, you know, I told you this last time beta that that chat that we had was one of the, my favorite ones that I've recorded in five or six years of doing this. And this is also right up there. I love that you guys, like I said earlier, you've created this conscious relationship together you're both focused on individual growth that then also leads to your collective growth as a couple here so uh, it's very admirable especially like i said in, in these tough times that we all seem to be struggling through on some level to just have ideas of hope and charity and love that we can share with each other and growth and kind of like what you were saying in one of your answers ryan i think too that i guess sometimes we just have to carve new paths for ourselves and that that's the opportunity that we have here And you guys have done that. I think I'm trying to do that too. And I I know some of the people who hear this are also trying to do that. So very inspirational chat here today. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for having us. And thanks for my, uh, uh, I won't say it, but thanks. Thank you. We broke your podcast, (laughs) Sherry, here. Yes, you you, you can say it. You can say it. (laughs) (laughs) That's cool. I'd like to end things on some laughter there. So yeah. Yeah. For real, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. And there you have it. My thanks again to Veda and Ryan for taking so much time and making so much space for this conversation. I thought this would be quite a nice chat for this time of year, to remind us just what this life and this experience is all about, and to remind us of what we should be celebrating together, which is each other. The fellowship, the friendship, the love, and the orgasmic connection that we can find within ourselves and within our relationships. 
this was really quite the pandemic love story when you get down to it. And I'm grateful to both Ryan and Veda for being so open to sharing that story with me and with you. I also wanted to correct myself. I was talking about the chakras, and I can't remember if it was in the free version or the paid version, and I said there were seven. There's actually nine of them that I'm aware of now, so please forgive me for that faux pas if you were keeping score. I gotta keep myself honest here too, you know? Anyway, the paid extension was jam-packed with more goodness. I'm not even going to attempt to recap everything we talked about because, one, it was all over the place in the best way possible. A snaking river personified in conversation, no doubt about it. Plus, I have so much more work to do and not enough time to do it. My schedule has suddenly got quite full with interviews and other new opportunities, and it's the holiday season on top of that, which means plenty of family time and fellowship, and I hope you're enjoying that yourselves. And if you're feeling generous, sign up for the second hour of the show on Patreon or Substack. There'll be an option on Detox.com real soon as well. You can also support the private membership association I'm trying to start that's centered on holistic wellness. Or you can throw a few bones my way to help fight the good fight against geoengineering. Or you can just donate to me personally, straight up. However you choose to support, you're ultimately helping me help you. Because whether it's health coaching or community building or clearing the skies so we can enjoy better weather together, or just eavesdropping on another hour of consciousness-enhancing audio, you're the one ultimately getting the benefit from all of that. This is truly a communal project now aimed at raising awareness, raising vibration, raising each other up, and raising that motherfucking roof. Because we're laying new foundations, building new houses, and turning in our notice to the Matrix slumlords. Because their time is up, and our time is now. And speaking of time, I've run out of it. So until next time, you know what to do. Love yourself, think for yourself, and reclaim authority. Authority.